welcome once again to another session of the liver transplantation series on the LGS forum. Tonight we look at one of the specialities, in fact the unsung heroes who have enabled liver transplantation to achieve the successes it has. The anesthetic management of patients with end-stage liver disease involves taking into consideration a severely debilitated patient with major alterations in physiological and pharmacological responses along with, of course, multi-organ system dysfunction. We also know liver transplantation is an operation which is associated with major physiological trespasses and where there is a massive interplay between the anatomy and physiology across organ systems. Therefore, the anesthetic management includes uh, optimal protection of all these organs, apart from obviously the liver itself. Their role starts with the preoperative assessment, moving on to optimization of the transplant candidates, includes participation uh, in the candidate selection itself, and of course, intraoperative management, extending all the way into the early postoperative period. Now, LDLT adds further challenges to an already complex conundrum. The margins for error become even finer here. The anesthetic management of the donor has a focus on minimizing risk to the donor and providing an optimal graft for the recipient. So as surgeons, it is not merely enough to know how to remove a part of the liver and plumb it into a body, which maybe is only 50 to 60% of the whole transplant process itself. It is imperative for a competent transplant surgeon to be a critical care specialist as well. Who, who better to teach us these aspects than the two top transplant anesthesiologists in the country today? To talk to us on the perioperative management of a live donor is our first speaker, Dr. Lakshmi Kumar. She heads the anesthesiology and critical care unit at Amrita Institute. She is also the course coordinator for the fellowship courses in liver transplant and pediatric anesthesia. With over 60 publications and 200 uh, presentations, Dr. Lakshmi is a highly respected teacher and often invited speaker at national and international meetings and is well known as a tough but fair examiner for MD and DM candidates. Our second speaker who will educate us on the perioperative care of the recipient is Dr. Akila Rajkumar. She's the head of anesthesia and critical care at the Rela Institute. She has been part of Prof's team from the very beginning. Having trained in India, Dr. Akila did her fellowship in the UK and has uh, experience of over 2000 liver transplants. She is also the course director for the fellowship programs in liver transplant anesthesia and critical care. Having served as the guest editor for the International Liver Transplantation Society education website and with numerous publications under her belt, is a highly respected academic in the field. But uh, before that, over to you, Dr. Lakshmi. If you can slide share now and then start your presentation, please. Okay. Uh, can you see my slides? Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, you can see. You can see. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Ashwin. I wonder how you knew about my proficiency as an examiner. That is the secret only among anesthetists and intensivists. Okay, so um, I think the anesthetists and the surgeons uh, share uh, theater and the management of the patients, and. Um, right, I think the slide is a bit slow. So, of course, a donor hepatectomy often is a, uh, is a management and coordination between two teams, the surgeon as well as the anesthetist. For any good outcome, you need a good surgeon and, of course, you need a good anesthetist, right? So, I've been asked to speak on uh, perioperative care of a living donor and I just thought I would <laughs> highlight the title for my discussion as pre-anesthetic evaluation, what does the anesthetist look for? Then the often asked question, how long do I need to fast? Do we need an epidural? Specifically on intraoperative management, I'll just touch about the role of induction and anesthesia drugs. What fluids and how much do I use? And the surgeons are very fond of keeping the CVP less than five. What is its role today? And with evolving minimally invasive surgeries, uh, with laparoscopy and robotic replacing open surgery, how has the anesthetist adapted to this? A small thing, modulation of immune response and basics on extubation and postoperative care. Right. Preoperative evaluation of liver donor by protocol goes by three steps. So I've just highlighted the steps which I think 
it will be of relevance to the anesthesiologist. Where would we look for any flashing red signs? If the glucose tolerance is abnormal, of course, the coagulation profile doesn't hit us very early. It's only when they go through more extensive evaluation that I would pick something like this. But an abnormal glucose tolerance, an abnormal thyroid function would definitely tell us that we need to evaluate further. How long do you wait if it were abnormal? For example, a thyroid, we start the treatment, then look for the values of T4 and free T3. PSH may take much longer. So a clinical plus a biochemical evaluation of these two and provided a control of diabetes is reasonably acceptable, then perhaps we may consider him for donor. At the second level of evaluation, a pulmonary function test, any abnormal signs on the ECG or an echo, and a stress test. Now, we have, uh, perhaps most centers have mandated the use of a non-invasive stress testing before you take a candidate for a donor, because a donor is somebody who's undergoing surgery without any real benefit for himself. Right. So these, these are areas where we might find areas of concern and perhaps evaluate or, again, reject a donor at this point in time. Pulmonary function tests uh, may or may not be done completely for the donor. Clinical breath holding tests and a cardiopulmonary bedside evaluation may sometimes suffice and replace. Right. So this, for example, was a echocardiogram, I mean, ECG of a 53-year-old lady who came in as a voluntary liver donor for her husband. So the ECG, of course, looks bizarre. And those who interpret ECGs would know that every third beat is a ventricular ectopic. At the point when it first came, there was a confusion among the team. Do we go ahead? Why do we put a 53-year-old at risk for any cardiac morbidity after donation? But then when you go through a simple test of stress evaluation, this lady actually walked a TMT and they were labeled as being benign right ventricular outflow tract ectopics. She was actually asymptomatic. She has undergone donation and is fairly comfortable today. Right. This is a data which I picked up from a publication that has come from Virginia as the reasons why they would reject a donor. And I've highlighted the ones which I thought were relevant to my center. Most often the rejection of a donor occurs at the first one, the fatty liver, which is usually picked up on CT. And of course, a biochemical support of abnormal lipid profile. The second cause, perhaps diabetes, most often the donors who come to us are young and we do not, of course, do not take uncontrolled diabetes. So we haven't found diabetes to be a contraindication for donation. Obesity, yes, we've had a lady who had a BMI of close to 38 who wanted to donate for her husband. She was incidentally a doctor and we did not accept because of her obesity. Allergies, not just to anesthetic drugs, but to drugs. We had a very young girl who was brought as a donor for a sibling. And the mother incidentally said, you know, she gets allergy. If she eats walnuts or if she eats strawberries, her tongue turns red. So we decided to do an anesthetic uh, drug testing in intradermal testing. At the third test, this girl had a ventricular arrhythmia. So that was the end of it. She did not come for donation. So these are exceptional conditions where we do go through a checklist and deny uh, the candidacy for donation in some people. And the highlighted ones are the ones that are relevant to my center. So uh, this uh, Dr. Sharma and his team have said a donor selection for an adult to adult living donor, well begun, is half done. Sometimes we don't do so well. And we have had, um, um, sorry, we have had this uh, lady who was 60 who came up for donation on a Sunday night for her daughter who was in acute liver failure. She was 62. She had a history of very good effort tolerance. And the, uh, echo, uh, the, the TMT lab and the cardiac unit of our hospital is not open at that time. And we believe that the good effort tolerance as is given by AHA was good enough to take her as a donor. Well, she did okay during surgery, but on the second post-op day developed ST elevation MI. She needed cardiac interventions and we are lucky that she came out without further insult. So there are lessons to be learned. And after that, we decided to be more stringent on donor evaluation, whatever the time implications for donor safety. So our experience so far... Should I pause? Please, please go on. Please go on. Please go on. Right. So the AIMS experience of about 925 transplants into 800 living donors. And as I have said earlier, a fatty liver or steatosis in the liver, sometimes a low, uh, the, 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 the mismatch between the donor and the recipient weight, 
obesity, multiple drug allergies are often the most common reasons why a candidacy has been denied. Cardiac manifestations, even if the patient did test positive at seven minutes on a TMT, and we went ahead with a coronary angiogram, on a couple of occasions that we did encounter a positive TMT, we have found that this is usually reflective of a mild coronary artery disease, which has been acceptable, cleared under acceptable risk with medical management, and we have taken such donors. So we've been rather generous in accepting cardiac uh, comorbidity with the belief that we are able to... Right, yeah. right. Now coming back, coming to the next part of my discussion, which is a pre-operative management of a living donor. So most people are worried, particularly when they're children, they want to know how to fast. Adults want to know how long it would take and they become rather irritable when they don't have their customary cup of tea or coffee in the morning. So... Uh, uh, like most centers, we also advise them to take solids and clear liquids. And perhaps as a step further, we've now introduced giving them the complex maltodextrin, 12.5% complex carbohydrate. So why do I have to give this? This is a 400 ml uh, liquid supplement that's given two hours before the surgery. The stay sleep and benefits of this are that the gastric volume and the gastric pH are not substantially different from those individuals who've been fasted for this time. It definitely reduces thirst. The patient feels better after drinking that uh, water which contains some glucose. There's no hunger, fatigue, the headache that comes with hunger. And it prevents the development of secondary insulin resistance that can occur after a period of fasting. It preserves nitrogen balance. This, of course, long-term and lean body mass after surgery. Can I give it to everybody? Can What happens to diabetics? That's a slippery area which we are still not sure. We do give it for Control diabetics whose fasting sugar is less than 200. And the 2R value after the consumption of 400 ml of 12.5% maltodextrin is, is as comparable as it is in non-diabetics of that age. But of course, there are some differences in the blood sugars that come after, whether they happen because of the maltodextrin or is it because of the diabetic state, we still need to complete that analysis. So epidural... Epidural definitely is a gold standard for any open abdominal surgery, including open hepatectomy, where the intensity of the pain is fairly substantial. And epidural has several advantages. It reduces the stress response. It reduces pulmonary complications, even thrombotic complications, reduces the cardio complications and so forth. But remember, it is an invasive procedure. A thoracic epidural is usually placed and the patient may go into an apparent coagulopathy at the end of it. So is this risk really worth it? The Cochrane Library in their analysis of nearly 22 trials, which included both open and laparoscopic surgeries, as which had about 1,138 patients included, said that the use of an epidural even in laparoscopic surgery was beneficial in reduction of postoperative ileus. We have conducted a study of 72 patients undergoing laparoscopic colorectal surgery and we looked at the impact of an epidural versus opioid analgesia in them. And we found that the epidural group definitely had a much better postoperative analgesic score, but they had a slightly longer stay in the ICU, which may defeat the purpose of ERAS, which looks at the time to ambulation and time of ICU stay. So when you're using an epidural, one definitely needs to justify the incorporation of the epidural and may have to remember that the patient may have a slightly longer stay in the ICU as well as an increased duration of catheterization. This is from JAMA 2015 and looks at colorectal surgery, where they've said that while epidural analgesia appears to be good, it comes with higher hospital charges, longer hospital stay, and a higher incidence of urinary tract infections. So um, uh, then again becomes the all-pervading all, all question. We have a hepatectomy and the patient on the post-operative day manifests INR that can range from 1.9 to 3.5 or 4 for up to 2 to 3 days. And we put an epidural. What are the risks of an epidural hematoma? I would also be treating this patient with low molecular weight heparin or fondoparinix to prevent the deep venous thrombosis. So what is the risk of getting a hematoma and what is the safety of keeping this epidural in situ? So this ASTRA article is an all-time favorite of anesthetists. And... When low molecular weight heparins are used, they are used as prophylaxis before the surgery. And if it's a once a day dosing, we need to remember to time the catheter at least 12 hours after a, a prophylactic dose and 24 hours after a therapeutic dose of low molecular 
great help for him. Thankfully, fondoparinex is only used after surgery. So the anesthetist is quite comfortable if he has to put an epidural. But the catch actually comes towards maintenance of the epidural catheter as well as its removal. So the timing for which the fondoparinex needs to be discontinued before the catheter can be removed is 24 hours according to European guidelines and 36 to 42 hours after the, by the uh, Association of uh, Anesthetists of Great Britain. So remember that when you put an epidural catheter, you're keeping the catheter in the midst of apparent coagulopathy. I'm again and again using the word apparent because I don't believe that this degree of coagulopathy is real. But we really don't have guidelines that say it is not there. So we are relying on static tests, which may be misleading under these circumstances. And definitely when you're going to remove the catheter, you need to ensure that the last dose of extra is at least 24 hours or 36 hours before you choose to pull out the catheter. So while we have done in an open hepatectomy, it's a gold standard. It keeps the patient so comfortable. And why should a donor who's as it is undergoing the surgery, he doesn't need have pain also. So we justify the use of epidural. I'm sure most anesthetists doing liver surgery are extremely proficient. It's going to take them three to five minutes to cite an epidural and actually do document dermatomal temperature loss if needed. But do I need to do all this when the surgery becomes minimally invasive? You see the location of the ports in robotic surgery and you see the scar which is seen about two weeks perhaps after surgery. And we keep wondering, is it right to actually subject this patient to an epidural? Well, the answer usually comes up as I'm not sure. And when I had used an epidural and a laparoscopic surgery, the reviewer of an article was very, very, very critical about the use of an epidural for minimally invasive surgery. So I had changed my practice. And now what do I do? So I try a lot of things. I might try an erector spiny block. Now, the unfortunate thing is unless you keep these things with a catheter, the, the analgesia may not last beyond 24 hours. And to pass a catheter, however simple it might look when a trained person can thread it for a YouTube video for you. When you try to do it, it's time consuming and one needs to keep into account that the theater time they are occupying and perhaps even the proficiency and success that they're going to reach. So right now we, we've tried erector spiny, we've tried erector spiny catheter and now we are somewhere here. We do a bilateral uh, single shot uh, transverse abdominal plane catheter, uh, sorry, uh, a block as well as an ileo-inguinal, uh, ileo-hypogastric nerve block that will cover the phenylstein in, uh, in, in incision that comes later on. And we sometimes substitute the tap with a bilateral rectus sheet block. So this is reasonably good, never as good as an epidural, but combined with multimodal analgesia, which includes definitely paracetamol etali and an SOS order for opioids, it does well enough. And one doesn't need to worry about the epidural hematoma or central neuraxial blockade when we're using this. So um, our current practice is that all open donors would receive epidural. When it comes to minimally invasive, at my center, it's more robotic than lab. 50% of the patients would get epidural and 50% would get blocked depending upon the consultants. And of course, as I've admitted earlier, an epidural always provides analgesia, which is superior to these blocks. Now, intraoperative anesthesia portion. So um, remember that when a donor comes for anesthesia and surgery, whatever anesthesia you might use, there is always a compromise of hepatic blood flow. The rule is that the hepatic blood flow reduction is proportional to reduction in mean arterial pressure and correction of the mean arterial pressure may actually correct any deficiencies in the hepatic arterial blood flow. So while induction agents are short-lived, the effect is usually over the induction agents that we use at the end of induction the inhalational agents have a slightly protracted effect. In addition, several of the intraoperative manipulations, positions, even the use of ventilation and the use of E, the retractors used during surgery, variably can compromise hepatic blood flow. And the hepatic blood flow compromise in the context of removal of a portion of the liver may manifest itself as an elevation in the liver enzymes. So all volatile anesthetics decrease the blood flow to the liver and it is related to the concentration of the anesthetic. When you talk about agents, desflurane, sevoflurane and isoflurane in the decreasing order of safety are the agents of choice in these patients. Any form of epidural or any hypotension can reduce the blood flow to the liver, but this can be effectively corrected by address to mean arterial pressure by the use of vasopressors or ionotropes. 
Halutin, I'm not going to mention it. It's probably nobody sees it in the theater today. So uh, this, this is just mainly for some of the anesthetists who might be listening. So the zone one closest to the portal tract is the last to suffer any ischemic insult, while zone three suffers a maximum insult if this blood pressure were to go down during the process of surgery. So as the summing up, desflurane or sevoflurane, propofol for induction, fentanyl as an analgesic, atricurium or cisatricurium for relaxation. Avoid major decreases in mean arterial pressure. Avoid PEEP beyond 10 millimeters of mercury because it can actually impede the outflow, venous outflow from the liver. I know some recent article has said that you can go up to PEEP of 14, but I think I play safe when it comes to donor liver. And you can, one can consider the role of N-acetylcysteine as a um, hepatoprotective agent. Now, uh, what fluid should an anesthetist use during hepatectomy? So, uh, um, the, the fluids are normally, when you talk about fluid replacement in surgery, you have, one is the basic fluid therapy which substitutes the basal demands of metabolism and the volume therapy which replaces any potential or ongoing losses of blood and fluid. Right. The vascular endothelium is no longer a single layer that was worked on the principle of osmosis, but we know it's a little more complex structure of an endothelium that has a lot of waxy substances and which is responsive to inflammatory mediator release that can happen during surgery. So whether you like it or not, there could be some leakage of fluid across the interstitial space. Iatrogenic hypervolemia can actually release the atrial natriuretic peptide and worsen this edema that one might see. So how does CVP, what is the role of CVP in hepatectomy? Can I use that to guide fluids? Now, this article has come and the, 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 the picture that I'm showing is the article that has come in 2006. And a low CVP is usually the surgeon's mantra when they start doing open hepatectomy. Keep the CVP low. So how does, what is the CVP actually? It reflects the atrial pressure. If the atrium is very large, the CVP might actually be low. But there are some people who would essentially have a high CVP. Now, when that happens, how does the anesthetist manage this? Well, you can give a small venodilator. You can give a small diuretic to ensure he's not volume loaded, right? And there are some pharmacological agents like milrinone, which can be used to reduce the CVP. And then, of course, the anesthetist needs to ensure that the transducer is at level because even if it were slightly lower, it could misread the CVP. And the anesthetist perhaps needs to directly communicate the surgeon to see the venous distension relating to the CVP on the surgical field. So while he is overzealously trying to reduce the CVP pressure to reduce any blood loss due to the surgical losses, the anesthetist imminently needs to be aware that the renal perfusion should not be compromised at any time. The blood pressure, if it goes low, can worsen an ischemic hepatitis. And should you go on to a restrictive strategy and keep the CVP low, um, a vasopressor, most often norepinephrine is added in to keep the mean arterial pressure at least above 65 millimeters of mercury. This is the article where I said that milrinone as a venodilator was used to improve the surgical feel and lessen blood loss during hemodynamic, uh, I mean, during living donor hepatectomy. And they said that it had a favorable effect on intraoperative hemodynamics as well as on postoperative recovery. Right. Now, while the CVP should be kept low in an open abdominal surgery, is it reliable in laparoscopic? So when you use a pneumoperitoneum to distend the abdomen, automatically there is an elevation in the value of CVP. Unfortunately, you do not have a direct formula that can say that so much of intra-abdominal pressure translates into so much of CVP and I found it consistently to be variable. The bottom line is that if you see a CVP of 12 during laparoscopy, it may or may not reflect a high CVP. So in these circumstances, it is only by communication with the surgeon on the IVC status that you might have to control the CVP. Although I would believe that keeping the CVP low appears to affect the surgical team less in a minimally invasive surgery than it would do in an open surgery. Now, I think my slides went a little jumble. The fluid therapy in surgery essentially consists of crystalloids or colloids. So there are some units who would use colloids and some units who would use crystalloids. Now, crystalloids are basically solutions of water-containing electrolytes. And 
some of them contain a base so the normal saline was said to be abnormal because it does not contain a base right now when you look at the standard ringel lactate and the plasma light that is most often used they contain a base like ringel lactate contains lactate and ringel acetate and plasma light contain acetate and plasma light goes one step further it has another base called the gluconate so the base is basically to replace the constituent of bicarbonate that is present in your body whereas if you were to give normal saline you're just giving sodium and chloride without a base and technically causing an acidosis so normal saline has slowly moved away from the armamentarium of most anesthetists i do know that there is a recent paper on the solar trial that says ringel lactate and normal saline have comparable results but this is my belief and i perhaps would hold on to it till i'm strongly proved wrong right so what what is the advantage or disadvantage in using a solution that does not contain lactate during a liver surgery now ringel lactate contains lactate and in the body it is broken down to bicarbonate now during the process that it is broken down if the liver were absolutely normal it would generate bicarbonate and consume some oxygen which will not affect the liver but when there is a liver resection going on there is a compromise in the oxidative metabolism and the extraneous lactate may actually confound the measures of measurement of serum lactate as a marker of tissue perfusion or liver function which is why the move towards another fluid that does not contain lactate such as an acetate containing fluid was introduced acetate has the advantage of producing bicarbonate faster than lactate not affecting gluconeogenesis and not affecting lactate as a marker of tissue perfusion of sepsis and today this solution plasma light or cabilite as it might be has almost uniformly been considered as a solution for replacement in patients undergoing liver resection now what about the metabolic profile so this paper was actually uh, published at the time before plasma light freely came into the market and in this a comparison of ringel lactate and normal saline versus an acetate containing fluid sh clearly showed the advantages of an acetate containing fluid on the bicarbonate and the metabolic profile of the patient now starch is i'm going to go brief because i think it's already 8:30 colloids are of two types starches and gelatins starches although were, were extremely popular 10 years ago have slowly fallen into disrepute because they were found to be associated with increased incidence of sepsis renal sorry renal failure and mortality in patients with sepsis although its use in non septic patients was really not contested starch is one gelofusin is basically a solution of of uh, of electrolytes which contains modified gelatin to provide the appropriate osmolarity now remember gelofusin does not contain this base that i'm talking about but gelaspan which is a modified gelofusin actually has a base and therefore will will produce the bicarbonate that is needed by the body the drawbacks here are the risk of potential anaphylaxis with gelatins and an interference with coagulation which is sometimes known to occur so this actually is a paper that we did with 25 patients undergoing major abdominal surgery who received gelaspan gelas four uh, percent um, gelatin gelaspan starch or crystalloid and we found that it did not affect either renal function or coagulation in the prescribed doses but in a group of asa 1 and 2 patients undergoing abdominal surgery so the other intraoperative measures now the surgeons who would do a hepatectomy would be worried about ischemia reperfusion injury and there were earlier uh, literature that supported the use of a single dose steroids to modify ischemia reperfusion injury and the current literature does not talk about any ischemia or protective strategy in donor surgery although there a use of two agents melatonin and glutathione precursors n acetyl cysteine has been suggested as a free radical scavenger and probably as a hepatoprotective agent so uh, this can be extended both for the duration of surgery and after a recent paper in an anesthesia journal speaks about the benefits of n acetyl cysteine in living donors started after hepatic resection and say that the lactate at 24 and 48 hours was lower in the group that received n acetyl cysteine versus a group that received crystalloid but i'm sure most uh, people who have done a lot of liver donors would agree that the lactate level usually normalizes within 12 latest 24 hours after surgery and i wonder whether this was due to n acetyl cysteine or otherwise 
just one little uh, this about ventilation as i am an anesthetist the standard volume control or a pressure control mode might be reasonable in an open surgery but in a lap surgery where intra abdominal manipul manipulations actually affect the lung compliance by virtue of increasing intra abdominal pressure a dual mode or an adaptive mode that combines both volume and pressure control this could be pressure regulated volume control volume guaranteed pressure control or in this drager ventilator from which i've taken the picture it's called the auto flow so the anesthetist just does not have to make minute and time to time adjustments on ventilation because the ventilator takes care of the changing lung compliance specific concerns to the anesthetist are uh, he or she is usually away from any immediate access to the patient be it a loss of airway a bleed or a line damping etc one has to crawl on knees and get under the table to sort out the line issues a surgical bleed at vessel clamping or dissection is sudden and severe and one really needs to be on guard for a potential catastrophic bleed the volume status ascertaining is always uncertain and we are left to the uh, comments from the surgeon about how filled or unfilled the ivc is pressure points the very prolonged surgery in a position which is slightly head up and the leftward tilt a lot of patients complain about pain in the right shoulder despite padding so i'm not sure if it is a, the laparoscopy or the position but you need to pad a lot of pressure points and of course you prevent um, because of the prolonged pneumoperitoneum they are prone to the development of deep vein thrombosis mechanical intermittent pneumatic compression devices are probably a must the post operative concern uh, is essentially analgesia as i've said whether it's minimally invasive or open it could be an epidural or a combination of blocks with multimodal phosphate supplementation is one of the key things that one would look towards in um, in uh, post operative care of the liver donors that's because uh, um, a hypophosphatemia in after liver resection has been believed to correlate with a liver recovery so we uh, don't know about that but we replace the phosphates to make sure there is enough phosphate for the liver to utilize and uh, regenerate soon enough um the time to ambulation and the little bit about the apparent deranged coagulation um while the inr may actually be 2 or 3 or even higher this most certainly should not and will not warrant a correction by the administration of plasma which was done perhaps about 10 or 15 years ago um with the advent of uh, the, the more dynamic uh, coagulation test we find that these patients are not actually coagulopathic on the contrary some of them are even hypercoagulopathic with the um, to to the effect that they may develop a deep venous thrombosis some of them may get a pulmonary embolism so uh, when you are looking out post operatively you need to be aware that they do get their time the um dvt prophylaxis doses provided the inr is not substantially deranged of course a nutritional supplement uh, and whatever is part of the eras guidelines towards early recovery should be done to enable that they get back to track as soon as normal so i'll just sum up a pre operative pre operative protocolized evaluation including a rehabilitation to get them to the most optimal state at the time they are for surgery the uh, the fasting of course i have said they should be allowed clear fluids and if available the maltodextrin up to 2 hours before surgery we have measured the gastric volume and found that the stomach is absolutely empty when they come in 2 hours after the drink the analgesic options need to be selected depending upon whether it's an open or minimally invasive surgery as a rule the fluid strategy is restrictive until resection any supplementation of volume usually comes after the liver is resected and an average i think 3 to 3.5 liters is the standard fluid replacement with crystalloids that i use i do not use uh, synthetic colloids and if i have to resort i would perhaps use albumin as a uh, volume replacement um, mean arterial pressure should be maintained scrupulously all the time to, in order to avoid both ischemic hepatitis and preservation of end organ function phosphate and nutritional supplements and the use of n acetyl cysteine may perhaps enhance the recovery of the tumor thank you thank you so much for that fantastic overview madam and for uh, dumbing it down uh, to the level of us surgeons um uh, if i may ask dr akila to give her talk and then i'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions for uh, dr lakshmi kumar a lot of doubts which i'm sure she'll be happy to clear for us and uh, dr akila if you can share your slides please 
Good evening, all. Um, thanks to Ashwin and the organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak here. Um, the next uh, 25 to 30 minutes or so, I'll go through the following. Um, moving. Okay. I'll go through um, the following um, in the following order. I understand that like most of them are surgical colleagues. So I've uh, tried to only highlight the um, you know, superficial, highlight the important concepts here. We can discuss at the end if there are any queries. Um, so I'll go through the challenges for the anesthesiologist. How do we evaluate a recipient preoperatively, the intraoperative care, the important concepts, and how do we handle them postoperatively? So um, uh, anesthetic challenges, yes, it is because of the nature of surgery, quite complicated surgery, a long surgery with um, potential for massive bleeding and the nature of the patients. The patients as such are very sick with multi-organ involvement. So um, this presents a lot of challenges for the anesthetist. I would like to um, like you all to focus on this uh, study. There was a from University of Wisconsin. They've done thousands of transplants. And at one point, um, the surgeons thought about it and they thought, um, although the outcomes are good, they, they were getting 90% survival at the end of one year, which is comparable to most of the centers. They thought there was lack of consistency and lack of concentrated expertise among the anesthetic colleagues. So they decided that out of the 40 uh, anesthetists who were performing liver transplant anesthesia, they chose seven of the faculty to do uh, liver anesthesia. And they compared the outcomes, having the whole bunch of people performing, uh, participating in the program, then having a designated uh, team performing the procedure. So what they found was um, their transfusion requirements starting from 2000, this was performed from 2000 to 2005. They compared uh, in 2004, I think they implemented the designated team and they found that there was a reduction in transfusion requirements, both RBZ and plasma requirements. There was a reduction in ventilator days, the reduction in ICU days, the time spent in the ICU for all the recipients. So their conclusion was uh, a designated anesthesia team will uh, improve outcomes um, in terms of transfusion and the ICU stay. So what happened was evidence-based guidelines evolved, low CVP in, uh, based fluid management, thromboelastography, which again, in use of thromboelastography, which impacted on transfusion requirements, having conservative blood transfusion triggers, uh, use of antifibrinolytics, and also they evolved to doing extubation in the operating room whenever possible. And uh, transplant anesthesia fellowship program also evolved. So th this signifies the need for a focused anesthesia team who can handle all the challenges and improve outcomes in the patient. So uh, OPT in the UNOS further set on to the device uh, criteria for a director of anesthesiology for liver transplantation and they undergo regular appraisals and assessments to see if they are fit to continue in their uh, position. So um, all the two, these two papers do signify the role of an anesthesiologist uh, and the important contribution to the outcome in this speciality. So going on to the preoperative evaluation, as for any surgical procedure, the preoperative evaluation should involve detailed assessment of all systems. I, I'd only highlight the important things which you have to look upon in liver transplant recipients. What happens in patients with end-stage liver disease? So they have uh, liver failure. There is a complex uh, inflammatory cascade which gets activated because of the bacterial translocation. Photosystemic collaterals are formed. So there is profound splanchnic arterial vasodilatation. The entire syndrome is called hyperdynamic circulatory syndrome, where the central hypovolemia is there. The central intravascular compartment is quite contracted. It is a peripheral splanchnic system which is dilated. This is something to remember throughout the plan of anesthesia management, managing them pre-op in an ICU and post-op again when they come back after a transplant. So the central intravascular volume is quite contracted and the peripheral system is quite dilated. Whatever fluids you give will not enter into your intravascular system and it will only 
uh, most of them will leak into this plant snake system, causing more complications. So they have uh, other comp other issues like hepatopulmonary syndrome, hepatic encephalopathy, hepatorenal syndrome, and all of those are thought to be due to the hyperdynamic circulatory syndrome. Now the cardiac involvement, which happens in these patients, um, it can be divided into those which are a consequence of the liver disease per se, like which is called the cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. And there can be disorders which affect both the liver and the heart, as in alcoholic liver disease, and they also have persistent cardiomyopathy, hemocidrosis and myeloidosis, which can affect both the liver and the heart. There can be other coexisting cardiac disorders in patients, which are like coincidental ones, like ischemic heart disease, valvular disorders, and hypertrophic uh, HOCM, HOCA. Now, uh, it is imperative that we search for all these pathologies when we are pre evaluating them preoperatively to optimize outcomes and to decide if the patient is suitable for uh, transplantation. So this is a picture shows evolution of uh, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, the portal hypertension per se causes, um, as I said, splanchnic arterial vasodilatation, SPR is grossly reduced, and this places an increased demand on the heart and LV undergoes hypertrophy. Now this, um, most of the patients who present to us for transplant can have uh, incidentally cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, but might not be evident by the test that we perform. But when you give them a precipitating factor, liver transplant per se is a precipitating factor. When the SVR gets reversed, the heart is not able to tolerate that and they can have elevated LV filling pressures and go into heart failure, pulmonary edema, hypotension, and all this um, arrhythmias and all those issues. So it is, um, we, we will have to thoroughly evaluate the patient to look for cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. So as I said, there's both ventric, um, systolic and diastolic function is uh, impaired. That is, the LV relaxation is grossly impaired. It might not be evident in rest, but when you have, when you subject them to any physiologic or pharmacological stress, there will be very impaired contractile responses. They also have a prolonged QT interval, which predisposes them to arrhythmias. Now, these patients with cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, uh, they are at increased risk for graft failure or death during liver transplantation and other procedures like TIPS, which increases their preload on the heart. But it is a reversible condition. With transplant, the cardiomyopathy does resolve. It takes up to six months to resolve. Um, other uh, important thing to look for in these patients is coronary artery disease. When patients, can, when patients have two or more risk factors of ischemic heart disease, the prevalence of CADL is almost 50% of these transplant candidates. And it's also interesting to note that if they have had adequate treatment of coronary artery disease, the outcomes of these patients are comparable to those without coronary artery disease. So the preoperative cardiac evaluation should include a 12-lead ECG, a 2-D echo, and as I said, uh, cardiomyopathy can not be picked up during rest, so you will have to stress them with a dobutamine stress, or you can perform a myocardial perfusion scintigraphy. Coronary angiogram, again, each center has its own protocol on to whom to perform coronary angiogram, uh, and that needs to be done to rule out ischemic heart disease. Right heart catheterization is performed in a select few patients, uh, especially when you're suspecting portopulmonary hypertension. MRI is uh, getting an increasing role. It can pick up your muscle mass better, so it can rule out cardiomyopathy better. CPEX test is a non-invasive test uh, which can evaluate both your cardiac and pulmonary function. Uh, I don't think it's still available in India. So it is imperative to do a thorough preoperative cardiac evaluation to pick up the right candidate for liver transplantation. Going on to changes in the respiratory system, uh, they have profound restrictive factors uh, which prevent their lung expansion, especially hydrothorax and the tense ascites. But these are mechanical factors, but once they get better, the lungs do get better. There is no intrinsic problem there. They can have atelectasis, and there are two distinct vascular entities, cotopulmonary hypertension and heptopulmonary syndrome. I'll deal with them in the next slide. Plus, they can have coexisting pathologies, which, again, we have to look for. Asthma, COPD, interstitial lung disease as in autoimmune hepatitis, and emphysema as in, al in patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So the heptopulmonary syndrome and portopulmonary hypertension are actually termed as a pulmonary vascular enigmas of liver disease. Um, so uh, the important concepts to know is treatment for heptopulmonary syndrome is liver transplantation. 
photopulmonary hypertension sometimes is an absolute contraindication for liver transplantation. Having said that, there are very few absolute contraindication for liver transplantation. Photopulmonary with a PA pressures, mean PA pressures more than 25 being one of, uh, more than 45 being one of them. So we'll have to thoroughly screen patients to rule out photopulmonary hypertension. So as I said, liver transplant is an indication in patients with heptopulmonary syndrome and becomes a contraindication in POPH. And um, complete resolution of heptopulmonary syndrome happens with liver transplantation, but it, it is very unpredictable. It is less than 50% resolution only happens in patients with photopulmonary hypertension. So therefore, the preoperative respiratory evaluation should, um, you should do a chest x-ray, arterial blood gas to see if there is hypoxia to rule out heptopulmonary syndrome. Pulmonary function tests need to be performed. In patients with pleural effusion and the hydrothoracis, a diagnostic tap needs to be performed in select cases, more so in patients with left-sided effusion, because they're very uncommon in patients with I mean, a unilateral uh, left-sided effusion is uncommon in patients with liver disease. So you'll have to rule out tuberculosis and other causes. You have to look, do a contrast echo in hypoxic patients to check for shunts of hepatopulmonary syndrome. HRCT test is sometimes required to rule out in, um, interstitial lung disease and other parenchymal disorders. We also look for reversibility of hypoxia with 100% oxygen just to evaluate the prognosis of the patient. And scans are done to quantify HPS, uh, with a, which is called the MAA scan. I'm not going into the details of these terminologies. I understand that a series of lectures have happened with um, various specialists. So renal involvement, again, is a big uh, problem in patients with liver transplantation. Different terminologies have come up and gone. The current terminology is uh, hepatorenal syndrome. The type 1 is, uh, is, is called HRS AKA, and the others are called HRS non-AKA. I'm not going into the details of that. But um, all these days, it was thought that the renal involvement in uh, patients with liver disease is only due to a functional disorder, which happens because of the hyperdynamic syndrome, which I said initially. But now it's been proven that a direct tubular damage can also happen in patients with uh, end-stage liver disease, which is not picked up with your routine renal function test. Almost 30% of the patients uh, in a study had a direct tubular damage. Um, another thing to remember in these patients is they have a rebalanced hemostasis. It's always thought that patients with liver disease will bleed. There are lots of factors which promote bleeding in these patients because they lose the capacity to produce coagulation factors, the spleen, spleen is not working properly, so you'll have thrombocytopenia and platelet function defects. But what's happened is for each factor which promotes bleeding, as you can see in the picture on the right side, there is a counter, counterbalancing factor which actually promotes thrombosis. So the net effect is that these patients are not at higher risk of bleeding when they come in a chronic stable state. In fact, some of them are more thrombotic um, despite their numbers. You see a patient with an INR of more than 2 or INR 3, platelets of below 40, below 30, but the risk of bleeding is not there. It's comparable to somebody with a normal conventional coagulation test. So it is not, uh, the bleeding risk cannot be determined by the conventional coagulation test in these patients. It's an important point to remember. Other considerations which need to be looked for in the preoperative period is electrolyte disturbances. They have coexistent hyponatremia. Um, which, which is a fearsome factor for any anesthetist because uh, rapid correction of sodium during surgery can put them at a risk of osmotic demyelination and they can have neurological damage post-surgery. Uh, Sepsis is another problem. Uh, these patients, they have uh, uh, their immune regulation as such is altered and their responses to any infection is impaired. So the, even in the preoperative period, they have a high chance of infection, and this can become worse with the immunosuppression which happens after transplantation. So it is important to rule out any pre-existing sepsis, a reason SBP, give them enough time for them to recover. A bacteremia, if it's a SBP, you give at least a week's time. If it's a blood culture positive infection, you give them at least a week to 10 days, and you have to treat UTIs before taking them up for surgery. So intraoperative care, um, mandatory support. I mean, uh, it is understandable that what, what sort of support is required to do a surgery as intense as liver 
transplantation as a, from surgical point of view from the anesthetic and intensive care point of view you would need an ultrasound and all vascular access has to be guided by an ultrasound no blind procedures are recommended in these patients and again it is required to have a machine in the theater to check your surgical anastomosis during surgery a uh, readily accessible blood gas analyzer because it's very important to be checking the blood gases arterial blood gases a rapid response lab service with rapid turnaround times and blood bank uh, blood bank services are also essential the number of blood products required will depend on the expertise of the center and the number of transplants that they perform uh, in house blood bank is always preferable if not you should have something with a very close the access so that when need for massive transfusion arises the there is good support the use of rapid infusion devices and red cell salvage systems again as i said depends on the surgical expertise which is available in your center but uh, to begin with it is preferable to have all of them uh, as standby we have stopped using them so the considerations at the time of anesthetic induction and um, to continue during maintenance are these patients can have difficult vascular access so uh, at sometimes you might have to put in a, a neckline awake before you induce these patients uh, because of the tense ascites and the gastroparesis which happens in patients with liver disease they are to be considered as full stomach a modified rapid sequence induction to be performed to avoid the risk of aspiration because of the hyperdynamic syndrome and the associated cardiac uh, issues there is a very delicate hemodynamic balance induction has to be very careful with all your vasopressors ready just in case uh, there are disturbances some of them can have massive hydrothorax so you should have facilities for intervention like in an emergency icd placement if required after intubation so it is preferable to have a surgeon inside theater when you are using a patient with hydrothorax also remember these patients have very delicate skin and soft tissues and they are quite osteoporotic so the pressure points have to be protected temperature maintenance is an important uh, aspect of this because the long surgery and the abdomen is open for a very long time transfusion of cold fluids and the liver graft which comes in from the cold um, uw solution so temperature maintenance is important and it is also important for the clotting capacity hypothermia in pes clotting so you should have um, various devices to protect the patient from hypothermia not just a bear hugger which you place on top of the patient it is a, it is good to have a water insulated blanket underneath the patient as well and um, avoid giving cold fluids to the patient antibacterials and antifungals are important the choice of the drug can be based on your hospital antibiogram but remember these are patients who have lots of fluid shifts and the uh, drugs need to be repeated every 4 hours to have good serum levels um good peripheral access preferably to white bore cannulas but if it is difficult you can go on with the central venous cannulas we um, we usually put in a four lumen line with a 12 french sheet for rapid uh, transfusion as and when required some of the patients will require a dialysis catheter either because of difficult vascular access peripheral vascular access or some might require a renal replacement therapy either in trop or post op so in the, such patients dialysis catheter needs to be placed but remember everything has to be ultrasound guided the monitoring intra op monitoring modalities as in major for any major surgery we we do the minimum standards of monitoring has to be there in addition blood gases to be monitored um hardly or sometimes to us again as i said everything depends on the stage of your transplant program in the beginning it's better to do them every hour blood glucose monitoring because these patients are more prone to develop hypoglycemia temperature and urine output invasive monitoring cvp and arterial blood pressure monitoring those patients who have cardiac dysfunction it is it is good to have a cardiac output monitoring like a pulse count or cardiac output monitoring there are patients who have uh, as i said portopulmonary hypertension which is which is a very dangerous uh, problem in patients with liver disease in patients undergoing liver transplantation in those patients alone pa catheter can be used to monitor the pa pressures trans esophageal echo i would say is the best monitor it is a real time monitor of um, the hemodynamic status it can also pick up intracardiac uh, thromboembolism and air embolism but it needs uh, a lot of expertise and it can be it can be um, 
dangerous in patients with esophageal varices. Uh, but you should have the uh, facilities whenever possible to insert a probe uh, when a patient develops hemodynamic instability. Point of care coagulation monitoring. Again, I would say it is a norm to have point of care coagulation monitoring because we just saw that they have a rebalanced hemostasis. You can't go by conventional coagulation tests with INR and platelet values. You should have a TEG or a Rotem or the newer uh, uh, devices like the Sonoclot. And you give your clotting products, your plasma, cryopreceptate or platelets only based on those monitors. Neuromonitoring is used in select cases of acute liver failure. So we, uh, in, uh, we know that there are three stages, pre and hepatic and hepatic and the new hepatic phase. And the changes which happen uh, have to be handled by the anesthetist. The pre and hepatic phase, uh, lots of hemodynamic disturbances can happen because decompression of ascites, bacterial translocation, there is dissection and mobilization. So this stage, there can be lots of bleeding, the surgical bleeding mainly. Um, big, during mobilization, this can be compression and occlusion of major vessels. So the degree of hemodynamic stability is based on the surgical technique which is employed. Some uh, complete cable clamp and venovenous bypass were used in the initial days. Um, nowadays, most of the centers have moved on to piggyback technique, which does not cause much of a hemodynamic imbalance. Uh, moving on to the next phase, and hepatic phase, when we um, were doing an anesthesia training, and hepatic phase was projected as a, a real doomed phase, um, which is not something we see in real life practice, because um, the phase as such is very short. Sometimes in very rare instances, if it's very prolonged, you can have pronounced coagulopathy, hypoglycemia, and hemodynamic stability. In our center, it's usually less than we have not seen them, but we have to be prepared for it. Um, when reperfusion happens, the problems happen in, during reperfusion is because they call acidotic and hypokalemic blood, which comes from below the clamp and the clamp is released, and also from inside the graft uh, when it enters the systemic circulation. Major problems can happen at reperfusion. Uh, cardiovascular collapse is a big problem. Bradycardia, hypotension, arrhythmias can happen, and occasionally cardiac arrest can also occur. Now, so uh, to be prepared to handle this, if the patient should be well filled and electrolytes have to be within acceptable limits, the potassium especially needs to be corrected before, uh, before we're ready for uh, phasing reperfusion. A blood gas performed uh, 20 to 30 minutes before reperfusion can tell us where we are and we can optimize most of the things possible. You, can, you should have vasopressors, calcium, sodium bicarbonate and a defibrillator at the, to be available as standby to handle the reperfusion phase. So um, if there is a 30% decrease in the mean arterial pressure compared with the baseline lasting for more than one minute, during the first five minutes of gra graft reperfusion, it was called post-reperfusion syndrome. The definition of PRS further evolved uh, with different researchers. They added arrhythmias and fibrinolysis. But basically, uh, to understand, it is only correlated with the decrease in SVR. So PRS can be because of uh, many things, but it does influence the outcome after liver transplantation. So we have to keep that in mind. In a DDLT setting, absence of a portocable shunt, prolonged cold ischemia, and presence of pre-existing LV diastolic dysfunction have all been shown as independent predictors of PRS. In a LDLT setting, uh, Graft steatosis and the severity of liver disease, the high ML patients, are all uh, shown to be risk factors for PRS. But um, in all the studies, it's been uniformly shown that patients who experience PRS develop more postoperative renal failure and lower survival. So um, important things to note is cardiac arrest during liver transplantation, which I said is uh, this is the most important challenge and a stress for the anesthesiologist and definitely for the surgeon as well. But uh, the incidence of intracardiac arrest, uh, which is um, intraop cardiac arrest, was shown in DDLT in the study from Pittsburgh, was around 5.5%. And 38% was shown to be due to PRS and 35% due to pulmonary thromboembolism. The mortality rate was a little more than 50% of those patients who developed cardiac arrest during adult liver transplantation. The higher MEL score um, was shown to be a risk factor. And remember, this is DDLT setting from Pittsburgh. 
so a uh, group from korea they looked after they looked into their uh, um, patients for 15 years who had uh, liver transplantation the incidence of intra cardiac arrest in their setting was 1.5% and uh, they uh, prs with hyperkalemia and bleeding were thought to be the major causes of intracardiac arrest so luckily what they have demonstrated is intracardiac arrest is not very common in ldlt scenario which is what we see and the incidence of thrombus intracardiac thrombus and pulmonary embo- thromboembolism which is a very worrisome uh, complication which is uh, widely reported in the west is not seen in asian population we have not seen so far in my 10 years of practice so this is briefly about the intracardiac thrombus use of te te is a mandatory required mandatory monitor in the west so they found that 1.9% of uh, liver transplant recipients have uh, intra- incidental intracardiac thrombus and most of them spontaneously resolve only very few patients progress to develop pulmonary thromboembolism and uh, rv dysfunction but when it happens it is uh, very rarely patients who survive because the treatment options are um, either you do a thrombolysis or a surgical thrombectomy which are quite high morbid procedures in patients who are undergoing liver transplantation so so rv is to be supported and uh, surgical thrombectomy and tpa administration are the treatment for these patients intra pulmonary thromboembolism again it's all been reported from the western world we've not seen much of it in the asian population so they reported an incidence of 4% which is significant and you can see in the graphs down there that the patient survival is significantly affected in patients who develop pulmonary thromboembolism it's not the disease per se it's the treatment modality which is more dangerous because you'll have to heparinize them which is a big problem during liver transplantation so going on to the new hepatic phase after the new liver is uh, put in the anesthetist role is uh, to discuss with the surgeon i mean this is very really important to be in constant discussion with the surgeon you observe for the functioning of the new liver see if the graft is taken up very well and um, signs of a well uh, functioning graft will be hemodynamic stability if the patient has been on pressors they do get better uh, there is improvement in acidosis and the lactic levels start showing a downward trend hemostasis get better the surgical feel looks clearer you can see clots forming and um sometimes you can even see uh, bile coming up in the next 5 to 10 minutes or so the surgeon's feel is uh, also important they they um, for the texture of the liver and at this point the temperature maintenance is very important as i said it's important for the clotting casket to have a normal temperature otherwise uh, fibrinolysis happens and the uh, again um uh, and hepatic phase there's a significant amount of fibrinolysis which can continue into new hepatic phase watch out for this only the point of care monitors can tell you about fibrinolysis you need to correct them otherwise they go into a vicious cycle of clot breakdown and massive bleeding so briefly on fluid management uh, we spoke um, dr dr lakshmi kumar spoke, spoke about restrictive fluid therapy for uh, donors i think restrictive fluid therapy is a norm for any major surgery nowadays um, they they, they re- renamed it as gold directed fluid therapy um, uh, what exactly is gold directed uh, fluid therapy in liver transplantation basically dictated by monitors the goals used for other uh, population not be applicable to them judicious use of fluids is very important the choice of fluid is basically based on the patient's clinical condition if you have to use aggressive volume expansion as i said in the beginning a volume that you give it does not always go into the central intravascular compartment it can go into most of them goes into the splanting circulation so it increases the bleeding from all the collateral vessels so you have to be very very careful about the fluids that you use during liver transplant recipient surgery portal venous pressure when it's high a reduction of portal venous pressure by using vasoconstrictors like vasopressin terlipressin and ocuteride can help in your bleeding accept low urine output don't keep giving them fluid boluses until reperfusion it is it is accepted during transplantation do not use diuretics unnecessarily to to achieve a urine output use only if there is evidence of volume overload follow transfusion triggers very very strictly it is important for the program to evolve a transfusion protocol clotting correct 
only based on point of care monitoring when there is bleeding during the dissection phase it is not only because of hypercoagulability it can be because of the portal hypertension bleeding from the collaterals giving more products at that point only increases the chances of bleeding <clears throat> So there's a nice review which uh, looked into the restrictive fluid management strategies and outcome and liver transplantation. Um, and, uh, close to seven RTs have been uh, reviewed. It did show that there was no association between restrictive fluid management strategies and AKA. There was a big fear that when you get less fluid, they will develop more of acute kidney injury. But this uh, review showed that it was not there. And it also showed that it had protective effects on other clinical outcomes like blood loss, duration of ventilation, ICU stay, hospital stay, and the pulmonary complications. So restrictive fluid strategy is becoming the norm. And this again is a review article. I, I want you to focus on the amount of uh, difference in survival based on the transfusion requirements. The kaplan mayer survival curve, when uh, this is uh, the one on the left shows a PRC transfusion and the uh, impact of it on the survival. 82 and 50 versus 58, 36 months survival in patients who have received less than 6 PRCs compared to those who have received more than 6 PRCs, a significant difference. And the one on the right again shows a difference in survival in those who have received platelet transfusion. They've divided into three, uh, no platelets, zero to two units of platelets and more than two units of platelets. So each unit of PRC or platelet uh, transfusion is an independent predictor of mortality in this patient. So you have to be very careful about the fluid you give. Go with the restrictive fluid strategy. Use transfusion triggers strictly. Point of care coagulation-based uh, correction is a norm. So uh, post-operative care, um, fast tracking has become uh, more of a, you know, um, people's fantasy, I would say. But actually, fast tracking has been um, understood as it's fast tracking only for extubation on table. Fast tracking doesn't mean only extubation on table. It, it, it applies to lots of other factors, mobilization, early mobilization, early start of enteral feeding and return to the ward. So the centers, each of the centers can make their own choices. It, it was uh, popularized with the West because uh, ICU beds were a big problem there. Cost was a problem and availability of beds was a problem. So they ext extubate the patient on table and send them to the wards directly, which might not be possible in Indian scenario with the, with the nursing facilities that we have. So I would say center should have its own choices. We are happy having the patient ventilated for few more hours in the ICU and extubating them the next day. Few hours of mechanical ventilation is just not harmful to the patient. Six to eight hours will not cause any harm. Earlier, it was thought PEEP will reduce hepatic venous congestion. Control ventilation will not reduce, rather increase congestion and reduce outflow. And all, <coughs> all these fears are not there anymore. So your center can adopt its own choices. It's not the anesthetist or the intensivist decision. The entire team has to be comfortable about fast tracking, and then you do it. Even if you have uh, uh, started doing it, you have to select the patient carefully, um, uh, shorter duration surgery, less transfusion requirements, uh, well-nourished patient with less comorbidities, and an uneventful surgical course should all be there to... Um, to extubate the patient on table. Otherwise, uh, take them out to the ICU, optimize them, and then extubate. But concentrate on early mobilization, early start of feeding, and then you can shift them off to the ward. Again, as I said, multidisciplinary inputs are important. Well-established protocols are there. Protocols need to work well. You should decide on frequency of Doppler to look into the anastomosis and blood investigations. Extubation plan, as I said earlier, if you think the patient is malnourished, you should plan for a tracheostomy earlier. We, uh, we adopt uh, uh, elective tracheostomy in patients who have very, very malnourished and been sick pre-op. Extubation onto high flow also helps them. Analgesics, again, routine analgesics are not recommended or maybe not required. We've not seen patients requiring analgesia um, as often as in other major laparotomies. So put them as an, on a SOS basis. Try and remove the lines and catheters as soon as possible to avoid infections. Immunosuppression is an important point of care uh, in uh, post-operative care of these patients. And regular monitoring needs to be there. Always have a plan to de-escalate antibiotics when you start them. 
So again, goal-directed fluid therapy, even in the post-operative period, they can have worsening of renal function. So again, you have to be careful with all the immunosuppression which happens and all the hemodynamic changes which has happened during surgery. Worsening can happen. The drain volume also needs to be monitored to be replaced with colloids to avoid hypovolemia. MDT discussion for any coagulation correction. Now that they've had a surgery as a rebalanced hemostasis is gone after the new graft comes in. Um, but we prefer them to be a little hypocoagulable for the new anastomosis to work. So if you think any cor correction is required, it has to be discussed with a surgical team as well um, and then decide whether correction is, uh, can be given. Some of them might require anticoagulants. So feeding physiotherapy, early mobilization, and a lot of psychological support is required for these patients because the steroids and the tacrolimazer and other immunosuppressants do uh, disturb their uh, neurology as well. But the most important thing here in the ICU will be very strict infection control measures. So to sum up, this is what I would say. Teams only work. There is no I or me or which will work here. It's only we. And all of us had to contribute to a successful outcome. Thank you. Thanks for the patient listening. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation, man. Very, uh, very lucid uh, talk on such a broad topic, man. Um, if, if I can uh, ask Dr. Lakshmi Kumar as well to switch on her uh, camera. And uh, we have quite a few questions on the chat window, but uh, I'll, I'll take the liberty of asking the first question and then kickstart the discussion. Um, uh, so uh, from an anesthetic point of view, would you have uh, different criteria for selection of donors for say different types of hepatectomy, say a left lateral segment or a, or a left hepatectomy or a right hepatectomy? <laughs> that, that is question part one. And the second is based on the type of the donor hepatectomy itself, open versus lab versus robotic. Would you have different goalposts of selecting or rejecting donors. Dr. Lakshmi Kumar, if you can go first and then maybe. Uh, I'll answer the second question of yours first. Um, would I choose a, a, an open donor differently from uh, choosing a robotic donor? I think as far as an anesthetist is concerned, uh, I uh, do not have major uh, differences. Perhaps respiratory disease may be more of a contraindication in a uh, robotic as than it is in an open but most of the times we get uh, ASA 1 and 2 you very rarely even get to see anybody who's sicker than that so uh, largely on a broad route perhaps not much of difference between robotic and <coughs> discretion of the um, anatomy and the first other question was do I choose donors differently if it were a left lateral uh, versus a left or a right correct um, uh, perhaps, a, yeah, I think now that you asked me, I never really thought of it. It was only an adult that I thought about. If you had a grandmother who was donating for her grandchild and you were taking a left lateral segment, I guess we would be just a little bit more generous because even if she was 60 and she were well, she would qualify for a donor in these circumstances. I hope that answers. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, um, so I you would not have an, an age criteria. It would more be the physiology rather than an absolute number then. Perhaps, perhaps. Uh, Ma'am, uh, would you have something to add, Dr. Akila? Uh, no, I think I, I would agree with that actually. The uh, other question which has been asked uh, two, three times in the chat window as well is, is with regards to analgesia. Now, um, I know from our own experience in our unit, we have used epidural in the past. We have had a large series as well, but we have moved away from it. So uh, how would you look at epidural analgesia versus IV PCA, Dr. Lakshmi Kumar? And then maybe Dr. Akila can also give a opinion. Um, um, the quality of analgesia that an epidural gives, uh, I don't believe the others can give. But then it's a question of risk versus benefit. Knowing that an epidural is superior, you choose not to give it because you believe that the risk or the side effects associated is not worth taking. So for an open, I would still go for uh, an epidural. If my technique were to improve, then perhaps I could put a bilateral erectus spinae catheter and manage. 
because when that works it really works well it's just that you need to be good enough you need to have the expertise to thread bilateral and then keep it it does work but um in because of constraints of time and perhaps lack of proficiency we would put an epidural because it's simpler for open and uh, abdominal wall blocks with multimodal paracetamol and opioid as a for breakthrough pain is reasonable for the minimally invasive right but um, have you seen epidural hematomas um, in your experience at all in a donor talking about the apparent uh, coagulopathy no the answer is no it is it will it is unlikely to happen because a patient is truly not coagulopathy i mean he's yeah he's not uh, coagulopathy uh, he will not bleed he will not bleed it's just that those figures are artificially elevated and we really don't have guidelines to say that if you can do a thromboelastogram or rotum you you can kind of uh, you know it's safe kind of thing that data there's some reason which is explained it's a bit complex that it hasn't yet come but perhaps it will come soon uh ashwin can i ask a question to dr lakshmi kumarchan i I'm sorry to butt in like this mm, go on um dr humar used to uh, constantly replace the vitamin k uh, in every donor we have done in pittsburgh uh he said there is a relative vitamin k deficiency i i'm not able to remember the reference of of the top of my head but uh, is it the same experience for you as well well uh, actually uh, i don't know about your center's experience there is this article in njm which talks about uh, coagulopathy in critical care and vitamin k is recommended we do give vitamin k uh, to the donor when we see the inr a bit higher but uh, it it really doesn't change the inr but if you were to do a a rotum or a tech they end up being normal because of a compensatory hyperfibrinogenemia so i think i wouldn't worry so much at all by the number you know and uh, having done uh, close to 800 living donors of whom at least 80% would have got an epidural i'm beginning to believe it is quite safe thank you thanks a lot and um, uh, if you were not to use an epidural what would be your number two choice dr lakshmi if it were an open surgery and i were not to use an epidural perhaps uh, i would look at rectus sheath block or wound infiltration catheters they work well and um, they are reasonably okay when combined with a multimodal anesthesia uh, dr akila and uh, your thoughts especially since we have a large experience in the past and now we moved away from epidural yeah um we used to believe a lot in epidurals uh, i mean as you said this uh, the analgesic effects of epidural are far more superior which has been proven in all the laparotomies which have happened so far but when i was presenting i mean there's nothing reported nothing uh, no risk of epidural hematoma which has been reported in the literature so far when i was presenting the series in ilts um we had two of the experts uh, speak about it and they said um, they have seen two patients with epidural hematoma although they have not reported so there is a the- we always thought that that was a theoretical risk but people have seen and they have not reported then we thought about a patient control analgesia we moved over to patient control analgesia and we see that our patients are quite comfortable as equivalent to an epidural the uh, the, the days when we were doing uh, epidural we didn't have a pca device it was a opioid infusion we found them quite drowsy you know i mean they were comfortable but drowsy and more difficult to mobilize compared to the ones on epidural but then when we started using a pca um, they very comfortable i wouldn't say they are any inferior to epidural and easier to get them on to the uh, wards because uh, we have worries in running epidurals in the wards so uh, by day two they ready to go to the ward it helps the recovery as well i think being with a family so uh, do as much less as um, possible for a donor surgery do no harm sure and um, from an anesthetic point of view what would be your red flags be in the immediate post op period for a donor i mean obviously if you have blood in the drain and it's pouring out or hypotension that's an obvious thing which a surgeon would pick up but uh, from an anesthetic point of view when would you be alarmed or when would you start uh, you know asking the surgeon to have a look dr lakshmi and then dr akila if you could take turns and answer that um um fortunately perhaps those kind of instances are not very common um 
perhaps if you ask me, I don't know about the, you're talking in context of bleed or uh, is yeah, it specifically no, bleed that you had it? No, it's not necessarily the bleed, but say uh, immediate post-op, uh, day zero, day one, uh, you, you have a donor and then, um, you know, what would your red flags be? Right. So, uh, uh, perhaps if I thought that the enzymes were a little high, patient is more drowsy than usual. And I think, uh, as I keep saying, they are, they are not so coagulopathic. On contrary, they can be thrombotic. We have seen a couple of patients who develop pulmonary thromboembolism. Uh, even despite these, uh, you know, DVT prophylaxis, which is temporarily halted with rather high INRs if they happen. And with intermittent stockings, they sometimes happen. Perhaps any drowsiness that is beyond uh, uh, what can be expected uh, or uh, symptoms of tachypnea or symptoms suggestive of a pulmonary embolism are perhaps uh, something that I would worry about. Uh, any numbness which is related to an epidural would cause uh, concern and I would perhaps stop the epidural to rule out uh, it is related to local anesthetic and not otherwise. And uh, about high lactates, when would you start uh, worrying about high lactates? Because it's not uh, uncommon to see 5, 6 or somewhere there. Right. So most often we found that uh, 12 hours from the time of the insult, which is at the time of resection, most of the time, the lactate shows the decreasing trend. If the patient comes to the ICU at 7, it's usually by 7 uh, a.m. or 9 a.m. the next morning, they're back on track. Or at least there's a decreasing trend. So we've uh, kind of accepted that trend and uh, not haven't seen too many things out of this way. Dr. Akila, would you like to add anything to that? Um, I mean, in addition, maybe uh, some of them we've seen a SIRS type of a uh, response, post-donor hepatectomy, they'd have a uh, tachycardia and uh, I mean, not many of them have required vasopressors, but tachycardia is a bit of a worrying thing. Um, we do a series of cultures and, you know, look for infection, but um, usually gets better. We ask the surgeons to have a look. And uh, rise in lactate, after we've seen a falling trend again, it's a little worrying, um, something to do with the vessels. Um, so that is when we ask the surgeons to have a look again, either a Doppler or something, to rule out everything is patent. Um, otherwise, I think we're okay. When you're running opioids, you have to be careful about respiratory depression and drowsiness. Um, from surgical point of view, these are the two things which uh, bleed and uh, rise in lactate after we've seen a falling trend and tachycardia. Mm -hmm. if, well, pulmonary thromboembolism, again, it's, it's a um, catastrophic complication, but we've, we've also seen it once. So you have to be careful if there is new onset hypoxia and patients have settled down. And uh, with these high lactates, uh, we do use insulin and dextrose to, uh, to try and bring the lactate down. Uh, do we need to chase those numbers? Do we actually need to do this insulin dextrose uh, thing to bring the lactate down or, or do you think it's not um, working? I'm not quite sure if it's working or, you know, we just started using it like the use of NAC and donor hepatectomy. We started using it from the beginning. Uh, we don't want to stop and see if it causes more harm. I mean, it's a placebo so type of, even if, I mean, it's a harmless drug, so let's continue. That's how uh, we've been doing it. Insulin dextrose, I'm not quite sure if it works, but um, uh, a new liver coming in, um, uh, that can cause, that. I mean, insulin resistance has been measured and it's been demonstrated in those patients. Post-donor hepatectomy, do they have insulin resistance? Uh, we don't know. We've not looked into that, but... Um, with or without insulin dextrose, we've seen the lactates falling. So I'm not quite sure if it works or uh, we can get away without it. Yeah. Dr. Lakshmi, your thoughts on that? Uh, have you used insulin dextrose? Oh, oh, right. Okay, sure. Um, the uh, other question which is there in the chat window as well is with regards to uh, thrombophilia profile, protein C, protein S uh, workup in the donor. Um, uh, so do you do that in all your patients, um, which I can take the liberty in and say yes. Um, but, um, where do you draw the line? When do you say no? Uh, would you actually say no to a patient who is, who has an abnormal thrombophilia profile? Dr. Lakshmi, then Dr. Uh, I, I don't think I'm very qualified because I haven't seen that situation. So I'm not sure. I would believe that if I saw an abnormal thing, we wouldn't take. 
what I meant. Uh, yeah, you go on, go on, Ashwin. I'll just... No, no, uh, after you. Um, it's just. No, it's, uh, yeah, um, as Ashwin said, we, we started doing the screening after we had a case of thromboembolism, pulmonary thromboembolism in one of the donors. Uh, we haven't refused, but we send those patients on extended thromboprophylaxis. We keep them on extended thromboprophylaxis. Uh, factor 5 heterozygotes, uh, we are okay. Homozygotes, we've said no. We've only had one donor whom we have rejected. Uh, but rest of the patients, we do them with uh, extra care. We look out for thrombolysis and uh, we discharge them with the thrombolysis. Sure. Uh, I think Dr. Ilungo had a question in the chat window. Ilungo, would you go for it, please? Um, uh, I need to ask this question before, before the chat window question. So uh, this protein C, protein S, and factor V was routinely done in Pittsburgh as well. But after coming here, we noticed that none of the uh, surgeons trained in Delhi or the anesthetists who were trained from the Delhi teams were doing that. So we were kind of left uh, wondering what the benefit is. Um, when I looked into this uh, details, we found out that most of them are affected by DVT and uh, pulmonary thromboembolism. Do you feel that uh, an adequate prophylaxis will prevent that despite uh, an abnormal um, uh, profile of uh, the prothrombotic profile? What's your take on that? What should we draw? What should we do this? Oh, can I answer? Um, <laughs> yeah. Whatever be the profile, they should be on thromboprophylaxis. Um, we start them on low molecular weight heparin on the day of surgery, actually, day zero, six hours after they've come into the ICU. They receive the first dose of Clexane. Uh, they do receive it until the day of discharge, but do we discharge them without an extended thromboprophylaxis is what uh, is decided by having these levels done. Okay. Okay, okay, that's that's a good point for me. Yeah, yeah, they they get it for up to six weeks actually after discharge if they've seen if we've seen a low levels. And uh, what is the trigger point for right heart catheterization in your program? Um, we do a transthoracic echo and look into the pulmonary artery systolic pressures. Um, at one point, we were doing for all patients whose pressures were more than forty. But then um, we look into the overall picture if they are just recovering from AKI, there's ev clinical evidence of volume overload. We try and optimize it with diuretics and see if they've had a response by in terms of weight loss. If that doesn't get better, that is when we go in for a right heart catheterization. It's not always 40, sometimes 45. It all depends on that. We put the clinical picture as well together with it and then do a right heart. Um, have you seen the unmasking of portopulmonary hypertension despite having normal uh, right ventricular systolic pressures in the preoperative evaluation? And the question is to both the speakers. I can answer that. Um, yes, uh, sometimes the RVSP alone uh, doesn't appear to be a clear surrogate of the pulmonary artery pressures. So we've sometimes had the cardiologist look and say RVSP is 55, but you know I can see the flow across the pulmonary valve. The diastolic is flow is low. Your mean pressures are okay. You can actually go ahead. And then at other times when the pressures are just about 40 or something, he says no, this needs a right heart cath. And I don't think they directly are related to the figure of the pulmonary artery pressure, which is assessed because that is derived from a TR jet. And yeah. partly operator dependent as well. So you really need a good cardiologist to tell you. And I don't believe they relate to the numbers. But as Akhil has very correctly said, we also go through this volume. Uh, we treat the oval volume overload and then relook, and then go for a right heart cath and then put the patient on sildenafil or something and then reassess and consider for, for surgery. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, if I may take a step back and ask you about uh, selection criteria in the recipient, is is there a difference be, be in a, in an LDLT recipient and a DDLT recipient from an anesthetic point of view? Would you look at them differently, Dr. Lakshmi and Dr. Akila? I leave Akila to answer this. She's <laughs> a recipient person today. <laughs> I mean. Um... The clinical status of the patient, if it's an acute level failure or ACLF patient or sick ACLF, um, DDLT would be a better choice in terms of liver volume. 
but um, having said that you should also look into the quality of the liver so each of it has its um, pros and cons doing ldlt or dvlt um but a good volume living donor might be better off than ddlt sometimes it's you know it's not about the time of availability and uh, operating time you know it's it's an elect well scheduled has social has for all the team members so the outcome is obviously better but um, it depends on the clinical status you have to carefully weigh the pros and cons there is what i would say but um, you, you would have the same uh, uh, criteria or the goal post for for both the ldlt and ddlt with regards to the heart or the lungs or the kidney um i mean as i said the volume of the liver um, volume plus the quality of the liver is important but um, in a patient who's had a borderline heart disease um, who's a high risk a hepatopulmonary syndrome will be more careful about choosing the recipient i mean the donor Okay. we don't take up marginal donors we would say more, no to marginal donors in a high risk recipient that is how we would balance yeah i don't know if that answered your question or were you yeah. no I, i was just wondering because uh, when we implant an uh, uh, a whole liver in uh, you, know, you know in a uh, we we would do a cable clamp so uh okay. Okay. that include your heart or your lungs and you know would you take that into consideration when you when you choose a recipient for a ddlt or or what would you just incorporate it into your risk factor and take it along i i do not think it makes a big difference um, the clamping i mean especially with the excellent expertise that we have i don't think that has been a problem so far intra with the clamping and the hemodynamic stability that it causes in a DPLT. No, I don't think that's a problem. It's the quality of the graft which uh, is a problem for us. All right. Okay. And sure. Um, the uh, other question which, uh, which I'm sure is very pertinent in this present era is with regards to the COVID and, and you know, with regards to looking at the donor and the recipient. Obviously, uh, we would use PPE and enhanced protection measures, but is there anything else you would... do in particular or differently for the donor dr lakshmi i believe that to you and the recipient dr akila i believe that question to you uh i'm not sure our patients would get their rt pcr done uh, a few days prior to the surgery so that we are kind of safe at the time of surgery having said that uh, i think one of our donors did get uh, covid on the seventh post operative day when she had a surgical issue was brought back tested covid and a whole series of people were exposed at that time so ever since then we kind of made it stringent because uh, the policies of classifying yourself at low intermediate or high risk could depend upon to the extent that which you are protected so we just enhance our personal protection and perhaps started having all the patients in the icu as well wear a mask to minimize some degree of uh, contamination i'm not sure if akila your center has different protocols yeah protocols are, are the same but what we've realized is rt pcr again it's the the rates at which it picks up positive patients is very less actually so what we uh, i mean there's a thorough education which happens uh, from the coordinator side so they are placed in strict isolation at least 2 weeks before the scheduled surgery so it starts from there not relying on one test uh, social distancing starts from there they're not visiting any of the relatives so you know so sometimes we they are in the incubation period and then come they come in and we are not able to pick them up with a pcr also so that is something we have uh, we are very strict about and patients seem to understand that as well uh, restricting visitors and you know strict hospital visiting policies they don't have any visiting at all they stay in the icu until they are discharged uh, we also added uh, we added hrc test as a screening um, just in case if the rt pcr misses it um, we can pick up patients and again um, education when they are discharged home to continue with their um, isolation precautions um so sure. uh, we just need to hope all of this actually helps uh, avoid uh, the post op uh, status but have you experienced any post uh, donor hepatectomy or post recipient hepatectomy covid and uh, uh, um, outcomes in that dr lakshmi 
Yeah, I just mentioned that we've had a donor who contracted COVID and she remained positive for a rather long time. She was on ventilator. She's had a very tough course and is just uh, kind of out of the ICU uh, and back to the ward. She still isn't discharged from the hospital. She's just making a slow, it has been tough for her. She had a surgical complication as well. She had a bleed and was re-explored on the fifth post-operative day. So um, I, I kind of made a statement saying we don't see that bleed post-op, yes, but this was one patient who did. And she also was unlucky enough to test positive for COVID and she's been through a struggle. Um, we just became painfully aware that, it, you know, we just thought Kerala was better, but we realized now it's a proper community spread and odds of um, health workers contracting COVID is nearly about, it's going to be about 50% amongst the healthcare workers. So we just try and take all precautions as much as possible, although we know it's not foolproof. We tend to break rules on and off. That's true. Um, there's another question in the uh, in the chat window. Uh, what is the role of calcium score and cardiac evaluation in the recipient? Um, Dr. Uh, a calcium score does, I mean, it can be used as a good screening tool uh, to pick up uh, recipients who would need a coronary angiogram. should be used only as a, as a tool. Because uh, the pitfall would be only calcified uh, uh, plaques will be picked up. The less soft plaques might not be picked up on a calcium score. But we did a small study um, with around 120 recipients. But um, um, it, it, we found that it was quite sensitive and the specificity was also very high in, patient, in to pick up ischemic heart disease patients. Um, so, yes, it can be used as a screening tool, but it should not be the only tool um, for cardiac evaluation. So there has to be an exercise test as well in addition to that. Okay. Uh, 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 Ilango, you have two questions. Would you like to ask them directly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ilango, can you make your announcement before uh, you? Yeah. Uh, all right. I'll... Uh, I'll do the Ashwin's announcement permission. first. Ashwin's permission. Yeah. Ashwin, can I yes. go ahead? Yeah. Please. Sir. Please. <laughs> so uh, tomorrow we have another lecture. This, uh, this is a Saturday night lecture on surgical technologies and evolving um, technologies in surgery. So for the first lecture, we are inviting Dr. Tetsuro Sakai from the University of Pittsburgh. I was actually happy, to, uh, happy when Dr. Akila shared his uh, work on cardiac arrests. Yeah, he also did uh, some work on the intracardiac thrombosis, and we're actually happy to have him here. He, Hilmi, uh, Sushma Agarwal, and uh, Ray Planinsik uh, were a great team for us. Uh, they taught a lot of things for us, and we wanted to bring their expertise to share in the LGS forum. Um, so he actually promised to give a couple of lectures. So. Uh, we, we would welcome everyone in this group to be there and benefit from their experience. Uh, we are also inviting a few guys from the Transplant Forum to talk on the develop, developing drugs and, uh, and artificial intelligence and artificial neural networks. Uh, but it's not just confined to transplant alone. Uh, this will be a, a late night lecture considering the uh, time differences between the uh, West where we want to get some of the experts to talk on this. Um, we welcome every one of you on behalf of LGS. Please be there. We would love to have everyone. The question for the day is... Um, it's, it's at 9 p.m. tomorrow, 9 p.m. It's, it's at 9 p.m. tomorrow. Yeah, um, the, li the link is in uh, LGS. We'll share it again. I have two more questions uh, for the speakers. Uh, how would, do you manage your analgesia here and how do you manage benzodiazepines in uh, small for size crafts? Uh, that's my first question. Analgesics, um, that's what I said. Um, surprisingly, post-transplant, um, the recipients, they do not have an analgesic requirement despite the big uh, incision that they have in comparison to other patients who have laparotomies. Um, we're not quite sure what the reason behind is. And um, we, we've seen a few reports where the analgesic requirement has been less, but our patients have seldom required analgesics. For the healthy ones who come with the hepatocellular carcinoma, with that being the indication, they have required analgesics. We give them uh, opioids in addition to paracetamol, but uh, we do not put them on regular painkillers. 
um dr lakshmi yes you have do you have any any anything to add on the analogies here for small for size grafts no um, she's right that uh, cirrhotics by virtue of the drug metabolism really do have a, a much uh, higher threshold uh, for, for pain uh, sorry lower threshold for pain perception so and there is a cumulative effect of the narcotics which are probably used during the time of the surgery so uh, usually when the man is stopped 12 hours after oh, they not need more some of them may have specific pain relating to the sites of drain insertion or at the site of the incision so those can be handled either by local anesthetic or by small doses of opioids the uh, second question is that um, uh, do you have an experience in using perioperative troposternal in uh, portable pulmonary hypot- hypertension patients um we do not see a good number of portable pulmonary hypertension as the 1600 transplants that we've done in the adult ones we've only had one patient with portable pulmonary hypertension and the pa pressure the max up that we've seen was only mm-hmm. 33 33 if i remember correctly so we've not had to use it i think the incidence as such in our population is very less so we have not had to use it fortunately dr um, lakshmi uh, any experience uh, perhaps mine a little more than yours i think okay. the early days no, no, of the <laughs> we've had no, one no. case of uh, pa crisis uh, probably related to an undetected uh, porto pulmonary hypertension very very early during the program um now recently i think now we are more uh, vigilant about it it's perhaps a little more than what you are saying considering your number uh, which is more than ours i might have seen about 3 or 4 but yes they haven't been uh, very significant and we are currently having one patient who's been started on sildenafil and i recall doing a couple of them like this but as you're saying the mean arterial pressures were just above 30 for just in the uh, range of moderate and they were usually uh, under control so between 25 35 at the time we taken for surgery and we do put a pa catheter in them we are not so comfortable with the tee nor is it uh, so freely available all the time so we do put a pa catheter in this uh, any further questions elanga uh no thanks thanks that's Yeah. um any further questions uh, from the forum um any of the other participants would like to make a comment uh, i think everyone's hungry you could probably buy <laughs> uh well as usual we have been at it for an hour and 3 quarters now we started at 8 it's 9:45 uh thank you once again dr lakshmi for taking the time out and of course dr akila as always she is willing to take a class and teach us uh thank you for taking the time out and for the highly educational session it's been quite enlightening indeed uh we'll meet again next week uh, friday 8 pm with another topic sir uh, would you like to say something dr patel i mean uh, two real wonderful lectures uh, thank thank uh, for surgeons especially i should say and uh, you know so very informative thanks thank you ashwin for your zeal and t- thanks for the senior anesthesiologist for sparing their time and you know you. Uh, enlightening us thank you so much okay thank you we meet again next week thank you thanks